And Hi, Justin. Good to see you, Mr. Carper. Was, uh, we are recording. You, you really can call me Don, Justin. I will. I'm just trying to be respectful. I will call you Don moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's 10, 10 o'clock. I want to welcome everybody. And we we'll just like could just have like an open conversation if you'd like before um before we get started here um there's probably a lot of people here that i don't know most of you have interacted with my partner justin who generally leads these today i'm going to be giving some insight on what we've been doing over the past um several weeks in our advocacy efforts and really we'd like to be responding to questions that people have but feel free to unmute yourself if you want to introduce yourself or um, as Don was just going to, uh, to do, ask a question because we are recording and um, I want to make sure that we help people understand the journey ahead. Before I start with my prepared remarks. Well, Mr. Carp, uh, Don, forgive me. Uh, why don't you ask your question of Michael and then I'm going to transition into a couple of recent stories and then I'll turn it back over to Michael for his prepared remarks. Okay. Uh, my son was in Leavenworth camp, which was visited by Michael last week. And my son said, can you ask Michael how he was able to get Leavenworth to allow him in to make the presentation and, and be available to inmates to be able to participate and uh, see his presentation? Because he says it just doesn't happen in Leavenworth. Well, it doesn't happen. First of all, thanks, Don, for asking the question. Um, one thing I will say is it not only does it not happen in Leavenworth, it doesn't happen anywhere really around the Bureau of Prisons unless somebody is really um, architecting a strategy to make these kinds of things happen. And that strategy is one that I really want to be talking about today, particularly for people who are facing challenges uh, with the criminal justice system or going through the crisis of saying, how am I going to deal with the you know, real complexities of a, uh, of a criminal charge? Because a lot of times, unfortunately, when we're in this state of, of um, being targeted as a criminal defendant, or we see the United States of America, in my case, versus Michael Santos, or whatever the case is for you, it's hard to see anything going forward other than what we're going through right now. But if we focus and really think about all the complexities of the problems we're dealing with, of what we can do versus what our attorneys are going to do, if we think about how are we going to navigate through this complexity, we can come up with a plan. And Don, to answer your question, that may look like I just popped into Leavenworth and was able to spend the day or two, I spent two days there with a group of people. But in reality, this is a part of a very elaborate plan on advocacy that I hope will work for everybody in our community. But it really will only work if everybody in our community also really understands the, the challenges that we're facing. Because as Don said, his son said, this never happens in Leavenworth. Well, it doesn't happen in Leavenworth because, because the Bureau of Prisons historically has really not had a, a focus on, on, on thinking about what happens to people when they leave prison, right? And I want to talk about that today because I want to talk about how do you architect a strategy to get the best possible outcome? The first thing that we've got to remember of doing is we've got to be prepared to ask questions. So as we're working through today's webinar, I really want to prep everybody by saying, be ready to ask questions. You've got to, you've got to be thinking right now about this entire process of going through the challenges you're going through. It's super simple to only be focusing on um, you know, the challenges of today and thinking that your attorney is resolving all of these matters, but your attorney's going to go on and, and have other clients and live their life while the person who's going through the journey has to 
deal with sentencing, has to deal with going into the system, has to be architecting a plan to get out, has to be architecting a plan to have a higher level of liberty. And if you don't know how to do that, if you don't know all of the challenges that are ahead, you don't even know how to build a plan. And so today, what I'm hoping that we can do is be thinking about how to create that plan so that we get the outcomes that we want. The only way we can help people in our community, though, is if we are willing to be interactive. There is, there is already thousands of pages on our free website at prisonprofessors.com that people can learn, can, can work through and, and try and learn. There's thousands of videos and audio files, and it can be overwhelming. But this, this process of us talking with you today is really about this, this concept of being interactive and you understanding what, what is the system I'm going through? I'm going to answer Don's question about how I got into Leavenworth, but the reality is that plan of getting into Leavenworth began decades ago. And it's just a, a, an iterative approach that involves many moving parts, including all of you who are in this community right now. All of you are part of our advocacy efforts. We want to help you get the best outcome for you personally, but we're also architecting a systemic plan to try and change this system. And it requires many, many moving parts. Part of it is going creating something that we can get staff members in the Bureau of Prisons to support our work. And there's a reason for that. In order to get staff members to support our work, we have to give staff members what they want, which are institutions that have lower levels of violence and higher levels of success upon release. If we can do that, we know that we can, we can advance the ball of influencing Congress to change laws so we, uh, more people have access to a higher level of liberty. Um, how do we, what are those higher levels of liberty that we're really advocating for right now? One of them is work release programs for people in federal prison, where if somebody has a job and a place to go to work, we want to empower the Bureau of Prisons to allow them to, to send that person home and go to work and become a taxpayer. That is a big, heavy lift, but it's a heavy lift that doesn't require an act of Congress because it's already in the Code of Federal Regulations. The Bureau of Prisons has that authority. We have to persuade them and push them to bring those policies into existence. And in order for us to do that, part of that process is going into federal prisons, demonstrating that more people who go through our courses are avoiding the problems that the Bureau of Prisons doesn't want and giving them the outcomes that they do want, which is emerging from prison successfully. This is all part of, a, of an ecosystem that Justin and I began building together when I met him in prison by that time, I'd already had a lot of work done because I'd been in prison for 20 plus years. But then it's the work that we've done over the last 10 years. And everybody in this community is part of that initiative and effort. You may not know it, you may not see it, but because you're a part of this community, we've generated resources that allowed us to build this process. So going into Leavenworth and every other prison in the Midwest, which is something we've been doing since last fall, is part of an initiative to collect data. This week, we just hired, signed a contract with a researcher at UCLA who is going to do a study of our program, collecting data from the people who go through it, and then create a series of, of um, uh, articles in a peer-reviewed journal that uh, that will demonstrate that we're an evidence-based program. And that is all part of an effort to persuade administrators in the Bureau of Prisons to bring forward these advocacy um, initiatives that we're after. Work release programs, 
more broader access to furloughs, more meaningful access to compassionate release, more meaningful access to executive clemency. And the very big one we're after is the reinstatement of the U.S. Parole Commission. So these are very big advocacy projects, but we can't do them without you. So it's, it's super important that we're always transparent with you and what we are doing. And I'm glad that Don Carper um, spoke about my trip to Leavenworth. But I'm going to tell you how all of that happened. It happened by doing the steps that we are recommending that everybody in our community do. You start thinking today about the challenges you're going to have to overcome in the weeks, months, years, and decades ahead. Because if you're only thinking today about what sentence you're going to get or where you're going to serve your sentence, you may not be making the best strategy going forward. I, I see somebody on here, and I don't know everybody in our community because I really rely on our team to, to do the interactive work, whereas I'm doing the, the enterprise work with the institutions. So I'm going to ask some questions of somebody. And right now, because I've never spoken with this person before, I see a guy by there by the name of Dr. Michael Rothstein. Is it okay if I call upon you, Dr. Rothstein? Yes, I'm here. Great. So I don't think we've ever spoken before, have we? Yes, we have. We, we have? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I don't remember you. But let me just ask you a question. What kind of doctor are you? Orthopedic surgeon. An orthopedic surgeon. And how old were you when you gave some thought to becoming an orthopedic surgeon? Uh, well... I'm half Jewish, so what else can I do? Either an attorney or a doctor. So probably around kindergarten, I, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Around <laughs> kindergarten. And how much work did you have to do to get there? Four years of pre-med, four years of medical school, five years of residency, and a half a year of uh, fellowship training in trauma surgery. Okay, that's a lot. Now I'm going to ask somebody that's on the, that I see on the screen right next to you. Doc, Chuck Jornby, can you unmute yourself? Can you unmute yourself, Chuck? Chuck, how do you do that? Un how does Chuck unmute yourself? There we go. Okay, Chuck. Couldn't you just get to the heard fast Dr. Rothstein give us his background. Now I'm going to ask yeah. you a question. If you think about a person that's growing up to be an orthopedic surgeon, right? Could you tell me what characteristics you think about that person? What's that person like, typically? Uh, driven, goal-oriented, uh, probably has a lot of resilience and uh, uh, grit, I guess, is what would be one of the, the key characteristics. Excellent. Good point. Now I'm going to ask the person next to you, and I see the name only as Coquilla R., <laughs> Could you unmute yourself? Yes. So we heard about Dr. Rothstein. He started working in kindergarten. We heard from Mr. Jornby, who said some really characteristics of what he thinks of a surgeon or grows up as a surgeon. I'm going to ask you now. What are the characteristics of somebody who wants to grow up and work in a prison? What is um, that person like? I would hope that they actually care about but, but, um, but that's hoping because you've got an interest but let's just talk realistically let's just think who grows up and says when i grow up we know that somebody wants to be a doctor they're driven they're focused they're disciplined they're caring somebody grows up wants to go to work in a prison could you describe that person for me forget that you're in the system or you've got a loved one in the system who is that person <laughs> somebody that's been affected by the system that's who goes to work for the prison you think well i and uh, as far as i i know the five people that i know that work for prisons um chose to work for prisons because they had family members that had been affected by the prison system and so that's why they went into criminology that's amazing 
that was not generally been my experience, but I'm going to, I'm going to trust that that's yours. Is there somebody else that might give me an idea? Justin, how about you? Could you tell me what thoughts you have about somebody who grows up and says, I want to work in the prison? What are their motivations in your view? Um, well, uh, from my experience, a lot of them had interest in like the armed forces or, or the, or in the, the military for a while or, or wanted to be like the idea perhaps of, of a steady, you know, paycheck every, every single week, showing up at the same time, leaving at the same time, perhaps lower levels of entrepreneurial, you know, thinking, liking, knowing what's, what's coming in. And that was sort of my in, in impression of, um, I don't know if anyone grows up imagining they want to be a, a prison guard, perhaps they probably right. just worked their way into it. I presume when something else they wanted to do fell through and the opportunity was, I would guess, presented to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone. I know people have said they wanted to grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. I don't know anyone that said they wanted to grow up and be a prison <laughs> guard. I presume it just fell on their lap. So, so, so I think the, 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 point, the important, the salient point I'm trying to make for people, and I want everybody to give that kind of thinking of who are you going, who is going to have discretion over your future? In my experience, and I'll, I'll grant it, my experience is limited to 9,500 days of living in prison. But I want to say that my experience was people that work for prisons are typically very rule oriented. They are focused on policies and procedures and their allegiance is not necessarily to the individual serving time, but rather preserving the order and security of the institution. And the more we understand that, the more we can start architecting a plan, the more effectively I think we can be in architecting a plan to overcome the challenges we are going to face. And those challenges are, are it's super important to be thinking about those challenges today, very early, before you go in. Too many people go into the system and the, first, the only thing they're thinking about, what can I do to get a lower sentence? How is my attorney going to help me or not? Um, where am I going to go? But I, I am going to ask you to start today thinking about what seeds can you start sowing today to influence these people that are going to have enormous discretion on you. And in my view, they're not going to be like Dr. Michael Rothstein, somebody who in kindergarten started thinking about being <laughs> a surgeon. Okay. I, 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 you're going to face people that have in that, that sometimes will look at you very cynically and they will 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 think that helping you is in some way hurting the victim of the crime and and that's how the system will see you so we have to anticipate that because when the judge has anybody on this webinar already been sentenced if they are unmute themselves <laughs> Somebody's been already been sentenced could unmute themselves. Yes. Okay. When they sentenced you, hello, um, this is Tamu, right? Right. Tamu. I and I know you just got sentenced a couple of days ago. Right. Do you remember what your judge said at sentencing? When he uh, he said, I hereby sentence you for a number of months. Do you remember the words he said that preceded that? Not specifically, but... Did he uh, say, I hereby sentence you to the custody of the Attorney General for a period of however many months you got? Yes, he did. So that those are very important words to remember. Because when the judge sentences a person, the judge sentences them to the custody of the Attorney General. And every person you're going to meet or somebody's going to meet when they're in prison, they work for the attorney general. That means they consider their allegiance to the system, to the attorney general. And when it ends and you finish with the Bureau of Prisons, you go back to the um, probation department for supervised release, in which case you would report to a federal probation officer. 
and a federal probation officer reports to a federal judge. So you have to be thinking, you are going into a system where, where all of a sudden you will not have counsel to advocate for you. It becomes really important for you to figure out how can you advocate for yourself? How can you build a case for yourself so that you're in a position for the best possible outcome? If you have the answer to that question, then I want you to feel free to unmute yourself and tell us how you are doing that. If you do not, then this is a great time for us to be having interactive exercises to uh, understand what can I do? We need to be thinking very early about the people who will have discretion over our life. How, how, how do they see us? How do they think of us? In what ways can we influence how they perceive us? The more thought we give to that, the more effective we become at architecting a plan. We absolutely have to have knowledge of the system ahead and we have to realize it is a fundamentally different system than anything you've ever gone through, okay? All of you, I presume, if you're a member of our community, you have been successful in various areas of your life. And you were successful because you came up with a plan, you knew how to put priorities in place, you knew how to work to develop your own tools, tactics, and resources, and you executed your plan to the best of your ability. That's the pathway to success. You cannot absolve that pathway today just because you're going into a prison system or just because you're now a justice impacted person. You've got to be thinking today about what can you do. And that requires you to know the journey ahead. So one of the things that I would like to do today is share with you another resource that we created that should be on our live on our website today. Um, we've done these before, but they have the rules have changed in the Bureau of Prisons as they frequently do. And when rules change in the Bureau of Prisons, sometimes the old policies no longer apply. So now the Bureau of Prisons is somewhat come to terms with its calculations of earn time credits. And so we've had to rebuild our calculator. And this is the calculator that we have now. Anybody that would like to participate in it can use it because I'll, I'll just kind of show you how it works now. It's really simple. Let's just say somebody is surrendering to prison. Um, Tamu, could you unmute yourself? Yes, I just did. I know you just got sentenced. When is your surrender date now? July 15. So I'm going to just put an 0715-2023. And your sentence length now is how long? So two and a half years. That's 30 months, right? 30 months, right. Okay, 30 months. And did you qualify for RDAP? I know. Okay, so you'll see there it says yes and it says no. So you would just click the drop down menu and for time we'd put no. But you are eligible for earned time credits. Is that right? Right. Your crime allows you to qualify for earned time credits? Do you know? It does. Yes, I know. It does. Okay. Because I don't know off the top of my head. But if I do that, I just hit submit. And right now, it, it'll just show up on our screen. Later, it'll be a little bit different where it won't just show up on our screen. You'll just type in an email or whatever, and then it'll get sent to you. But there it is. As soon as you send that, you'll have there... The projected release date for you is going to be August the 4th, 2024. Your projected good time credits will be four and a half months. Your RDAP will be zero months because you didn't qualify. That's what you said, right? You did not qualify? I did not qualify as of now. As of now. Okay, right. earn time credits. Um, the most that you can anticipate is 12 months. Um, and, and so you'll have a total roughly time in the Bureau of Prisons, roughly, you can kind of expect, and I gotta, gotta play with it. I, gotta, I wanna check that myself right now. That math looks wonky to me, but I will check it. Um, we should be able to get like the best possible outcome. If we get the best possible outcome, 
it looks like you could satisfy that sentence in about, you could be transitioning at least to home confinement in about 13 or 14 months. For, for that to happen, everything has to go just right. So you're going to want to figure out, well, what's the best possible outcome? And then be thinking, what strategies do I need to put in place to make sure I am in the best possible outcome? The more knowledge you have about the system, the more you can anticipate these very cynical people that are going to have discretion over your life. You, so you've got to know the rules. You've got to know what, given the rules, okay? Because the BOP, they don't have infinite power. They have to abide by the law. So they can only do what the law allows them to do. But you have to know they have discretion on how they're going to dispense justice, how they're going to qualify you. And if you architect a good strategy, you're going to be in the best position. I can tell you, I will be fighting outside to push the macro changes and our team, Justin, Scott, Scott, Joseph, um, all the different people on our team will be working hopefully to help with the micro changes. You'll be able to get that also on our website mm -hmm. for free, but you've got to always be thinking you're in a crisis. And in a, while in a crisis, it's super important to be thinking about how am I going to navigate this strategy? We've spoken a lot about release plans. Um, before the end of today, I will talk a little bit more about getting into Leavenworth. But now that I've given you that background before I turn it over to Justin, I'm going to just really answer the question clearly for Mr. Carper, Donald Carper. When I started in my prison sentence in 1987, I knew I wanted to be an advocate for change. And that commitment to advocating for change needed to be needed required that I do the same thing I'm telling you to do. Come up with a plan, put priorities in place, develop tools, tactics, and resources, and execute the plan every single day, even if it doesn't seem like there's any benefit coming. So for the plan for me was, first, I have to get an education, because if I don't have an education, I'll never develop develop um, credibility. Then I have to write books. So I've got a platform to use to bring about change. Then I have to go on the speaking tours to try and develop a, a bigger voice for advocacy. So speaking in judicial conferences and universities and in prison systems, hopefully persuading people. Then developing courses that I can bring into prisons so that I can collect data and say, oh, people going through these programs are less likely to offend, which is one of the reasons I suspect that many of you on this program are part of that curriculum where you know, we're creating these courses that go into books like this. They get distributed into prisons. Through that process, we get more access to the prison system. And, and, and hopefully you get as one of the contributors of the course, you get the um, value of demonstrating you too are working in this advocacy effort, then pushing administrators. By me doing that over and over and over again over years, I've developed relationships with many subject matter experts who are former BOP staff members or judicial people that are serving, that um, work in the system, and they open relationships for me. So, I only say that to you because I want you to go into the system with your eyes wide open. Some of you may have seen things, and I'm going to share my screen right here. I got to load it up. I want to share my screen again. And um, let's see, how do I do that? Hold on one second. Share the screen. And Justin, I'll just give it to you in just a second. If those of you who are looking at our website, and you click on this link right here and you go to resources and you see these subject matter experts, I want you to know, we definitely hire these people. Former, and I know that Justin's gonna try, uh, have Chris Maloney on a webinar soon. That's the former chief of US probation. Um, that's the former director of the Bureau of Prisons. We've interviewed them. These are former judges, okay? These are former heads of half a houses, former wardens, 
These are all people that we hire for one reason, to help members of our community learn how to advocate for themselves. But just because we have them on the program, please don't think that they are in the business of helping. When Remember, when they were working for the prison system, they're in the business of saying no. They report to the attorney general. Our job is to figure out how do we navigate that even in that environment? And I, I, it's very important that members of our community realize there's no magic pill. There's no um, you know, uh, happy talk that we can give you that says everything is going to be great. I want you to know there's always a struggle. There's always a challenge. And that in anticipation of helping members of our community understand what is difficult to understand because they've never been in the system before, we've created a new resource. That's this one. It's called Post-Conviction Remedies. I just published this book and we're sending it to members of our community in prison so that they will have just an explainer of what is what happens now after you've been sentenced? What is a direct appeal? What is the structure of the judicial system? How do the, these different layers of the court system apply to you? What is a collateral attack, a 2255? Or, and, and in what ways are there barriers to justice with the Prison Litigation Reform Act or the ADEPA law? Or what does it mean to exhaust administrative remedies? All of these are, are resources that are at your disposal in your pursuit of self-advocacy. But if you don't understand them, if you don't understand what a compassionate release motion is or executive clemency is, or how to use a 2241 or a Bivens action, um, or how fines will apply to you, you, you are not going to be as strong as you need to be when you encounter the challenges that are definitely going to come. So, one thing we always say is anything you buy from us, you can get for free on our website if you're willing to do the work. But you've got to realize you have to become an expert at self-advocacy. You've got to anticipate the challenges you're going to face and say, I know how I'm going to get through this. And I'm going to start sowing seeds today that will put me on a better pathway for success in the weeks months, years, and decades ahead. So, so that's really what I wanted to say in my opening remarks. It's 30 minutes. You guys know I can go for hours and I don't want to do that. I want to listen to you. I know that Justin has some, some thoughts that he wants to share, but I am urging all of you, get your questions ready. At the bottom of this screen, if you hover over it, you will see a section that allows you to raise your hand let me just see where that is. I think it's under reactions. Yes. If you click the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen and you have questions for us, just click that little button that says raise hand. And then we will call on you in turn after Justin uh, shares with you some of the stories that he wanted to offer. Um, and then we'll just kind of open this up for an interactive dialogue um, mm -hmm. because I want to help you in the best way that I can help you during these interactive webinars is to respond to your questions. JP, go for it. Thank you, five or 10 minutes here. Quickly, There, are, someone in our community received a phone call last night from someone who claims to work for the Bureau of Prisons telling them they are processing the paperwork for their husband's release. At the end, they ask for money. So it's a scam that's been going around. Someone in our community has fallen victim to it. They're currently at Pensacola. So no one from the BOP is going to call you to process paperwork and, that, and then ask for your credit card at the end, uh, but it's continuing to happen. Uh, we just want you to be careful about that. Michael said something a, a moment ago, like doing the work. And there's one thing to, to know to do it and another one, another thing to actually do it. So last week I filmed a YouTube short that I sent out this morning 
about a physician just outside of Fort Worth who called me like six months ago. I was at California Adventure with my daughter. And he said, I've been watching all of your, your videos, though I don't think a lot of what you are suggesting I do applies to me because I have so many extenuating or mitigating circumstances. Don't think for a moment that mitigating means uh, you're not, you may not go to prison. It's great to have mitigating factors if you accept responsibility, you're working, you pay back the money, you're building a, a new record as a law-abiding citizen. Some people actually turn themselves in. It's wonderful to mitigate, but mitigate does not mean you are not going to prison. And this physician mistakenly presumed because he had these things going in his corner that things that we encourage you to do, like advocating, preparing for the probation report, creating your personal narrative, growing your network and asking those people to write letters to support you, holding the lawyer, the holding the lawyers accountable. For example, this physician didn't even receive his sentencing memorandum yet. It was already turned in. So he called six months ago and then he called me last week to essentially say like, I was wrong. Uh, my mom and dad or my wife and children think I'm different, but in the eyes of the U.S. attorney, I don't think I'm different than any other criminal that they come across. They want to send me to prison for 60 months. They want to take my retirement funds because I have no money left. And I just learned they're going to take 10% of my social security. They're going to issue these DOJ press releases. I'm really no different. It's one thing to have no idea what to do, and you can almost have more sympathy for someone who has no idea what to do. But if you're on these webinars, and he said he binged watch all of the videos that Michael and I produce, including the videos with the federal judges. So to know what to do and not do it is very difficult for him because now he has what he would say is just regret that he can't change the last six months of his life. He can't go back and undo it. So if there are things you think you should be doing, we encourage you to assess what they are and implement it. If you're unsure, ask us. For example, last week, someone called to say, I'm disappointed that I wrote this narrative because Michael interviewed Judge Bennett, who said it would be a good idea to get this narrative to the probation officer, but my probation officer is against it. How do I resolve that? And we presented a few options on how to resolve it. Do nothing or go a different road, which is encourage asking the probation officer to read it and put it into the probation report, even if it might not align with your attorney's position. But in this case, the attorney said, I love the narrative, this will help you. So if it, you love it and you think it will help me in front of the judge, why wouldn't I get this information to a probation officer who will recommend how long I serve in prison? And through that work, the defendant advocated, he felt more comfortable. He got it to the probation officer who then said, this really helped me. Thank you for doing my job. I've learned a lot more about you. Had it not been for the webinar, he wouldn't have done it. But many of you know what to do and still don't do it. And this physician is feeling that pain. One other story, I did a YouTube live video on this three days ago about a physician in California, graduate of USC like me, uh, in the medical school who called to tell me that he was stunned to hear the government's asking for prison. And his lawyers conveyed to him, and the lawyers are good lawyers, and they have good intentions, and I think they were just trying to manage his expectations or give him hope, but he was so hopeful that he presumed he didn't really have to prepare, and like Judge Pearson told me one time a long, long time ago, if you think you're going to get probation or two years, like prepare like you're going to get a life sentence, work that hard, treat it like a full-time job, that's when you probably get the outcome you want. In this instance, the physician turned himself in. He believed these mitigating factors would compel the government to not ask for money, turning himself in, surrendering his license. The scheme only went on for a few months. And of course, in this climate, you're going to go to prison. He's a physician with a license. And as I said in that video, when I came home in like 9, 10, 11, and 12, it was all these Ponzi schemers going to prison. It was the insider trading. Those have kind of scaled back. It's physicians and payroll protection type fraud. And if you look at the press release that was issued in this case, it's the same press release they issue across the country. Doctors have to be held to a higher standard. They're trained to take care of patients. When you violate that trust, we're going to send you to prison. And this physician didn't consider that when he signed a plea agreement many months ago. And it's the same thing as that physician from Texas. Regret, I'd love to go back and do it differently. And the takeaway is both knew what to do. They didn't do it because they thought they were different. So we support you. We don't want you to go to prison. We know the way your mom and dad and your children and your network views you. You have to understand a case manager may view you differently. A probation officer may view you differently. Your judge may view you differently is evidenced by videos we share from sentencing hearings like when I attended a few months ago in Los Angeles where a client, well, I, I was there at a client sentencing. I attended a sentencing beforehand and the mother essentially said to the judge, don't send me to prison. I have I have children. I, I pled guilty. I cooperated extensively. 
And the judge said, I understand and I appreciate that. But if you were so concerned about your children, you wouldn't have broken the law. And it was the bad messaging. So that's what I wanted to convey in this five or 10 minutes. If you're here, you know what to do. Um, the question is, are you going to do it? And are you willing to have some tough conversations? Are, are you willing to take the advice of people we interview, like the judges and probation officers? And if you have questions, that's why we are here to work through them. And uh, lastly, I'll say, I would love nothing more for you to write a narrative to your lawyer, say, this is fantastic. The probation officer says, yes, I'll put it in the probation report and for the judge to comment on it at sentencing. Sometimes that has happened. John, who just surrendered to federal prison for eight and a half years, Michael's going to a prison where he is. That happened for him. Fantastic. It won't always work that way, which means you need education and confidence to advocate if it's just not a straight line uh, to the end here. That said, I see some hands up. Steve and Gina. Gina, it's good to speak with you. Gina, if you could write, lower your hand. And Michael and I and Scott, we're all ready to respond. Hey there. Um, it's Steve. I have a question for you. Hi, Steve. Um, let's say that the uh, your probation officer doesn't want to admit your personal narrative into your pre-sentence report. As a last case or last chance scenario or or like as a Hail Mary, can you present it to the judge, your personal narrative, the morning of your sentencing and ask him to read it? A couple of thoughts here, Michael can chime, Michael and Scott can chime in. First off, you have access to our probation report course. And yep. I put up a video last week or earlier this week, articulating what you can do if your probation officer chooses not to insert your narrative into the probation report. That happened with someone in our community whose supervisor said, I will not submit it. We presented a few options. So I need you to log into your probation report course. You'll see two emails that Michael wrote, along with a video that I filmed that provide, gives you options on what to do if the probation officer won't take it. To the, to the judge, your, your lawyer will submit a sentencing memorandum in advance of your sentencing, and your memorandum should be augmented with your character reference letters and your narrative. So your judge will get that package replete with your narrative. We like the idea of getting the narrative to the probation officer as it could influence the recommendation. If you're in prison and your case manager has the probation report, they could see the narrative. And Michael interviewed Chris Maloney. And Chris Maloney told Michael the first thing a probation officer will probably do when they get your file is look at your probation report. And that interview could have been done years earlier. Does it help you if they see you took the time to write this narrative? So Lastly, I would not encourage you to read an eight or nine page narrative at your sentencing hearing. You want to read an abridged version. It should be a shorter statement, perhaps a page or two. But even now, you should begin asking your lawyer, what is the process for the memorandum? Am I involved? And will I have an, in advance of enough time to review it? Scott spoke with someone last week. They're like, hey, I just heard about a sentencing memorandum. My lawyer just told me it's due today. And he had like 15 minutes to review it. There was no point in even sending it. So these are the questions we want you to be asking your lawyers right now. Um, I I will also yeah just can I am I on mute? Let me see yeah no you're with us, Miss Steve. Um, just to, just to give you the bullet point for everybody who may not have access to that course, what would I recommend that you do? I'll just tell you what I wrote in those emails. Is if you look at our website, you will see the interviews with the judges, and there's actually if you click on the links you'll see where I asked specific questions. And I asked those judges specific questions of how influential would it be to you if you find somebody who's expressing their story and what influenced them and how they identify with victims and what they learned about this criminal procedure if they did that at the time of the probation report. And I give you the time clips. So here is the recommendation that's in that email for those of you who don't have access to our learning management system which I recommend you get. But if you don't, here's basically what I wrote to say. Dear probation officer, Jim, um, I have asked, I, I wanna just point out to you some research I've been doing with interviews of federal judges. Here are two federal judges who expressed how important it would be to them, how influential it would be to them if they were to see somebody expressing their story at the time of the probation report. And I would like you to review those. And because of what those judges have said, I want to include my narrative at that stage. And if you will not do that, please provide me the contact information to your supervisor so I can send it to them. I will be giving it to the judge, but based on what these judges said, 
here's the clip. I would like to you to make this a part of my probation report. That's an and that's a proactive, you know, initiative that you are trying to take control of your future. It's about you understanding this is more important to you than anybody else. But it's kind of what I started at the beginning of this. You've got to put yourself in the mindset of the people who have discretion over your life. What can you do to influence them? And Robert Reyes asked a question on the chat that I'm going to respond to about that very subject. But I just wanted to just tell you, for those of you who don't have access to our learning management system, that's what we recommend that you do. It's what we say. Everything's free on our website. You just have to spend, it's kind of tough to navigate because there's a, we produce so much content. But if you watch those interviews with the judges, you're going to see what the judges said. Then you have to use your critical thinking to figure out how do I take this story and use it to advocate for myself. You are always going to have to be advocating for yourself. And, and the resistance you face is just practice for what's coming. And, and one thing I'll say before we turn it over to question, all of you know our community and member, Ron Thorgmartin, who just surrendered to Montgomery for six years, was on every webinar till he went away. Scott, perhaps you can put a, a link to the YouTube video I did with Ron before he went in. Mm -hmm. And Ron shared how he he essentially got the narrative to the probation officer, but between this, the probation interview and sentencing, he worked on one of these prison courses or community service courses with Michael. Then he augmented or updated the narrative for the judge. So this narrative is kind of like your release plan. It's a growing, breathing, living document. So the probation officer had one narrative. Then he wasn't sentenced for eight or nine months later. Then the narrative was updated again. So the judge actually read too. This is my narrative at my probation interview. This is what I've done since my probation interview. Here it is at sentencing. And now he's building his release plan in, in prison. You're able to show that growth because some I've been to sentencing hearings where a judge will fillet a defendant and say like, okay, you have an MBA, you have a hundred character reference. I was like, what have you been doing for two years? Sitting at home playing video games? You're not working. So to the extent that you can show what you're doing, it helps you. I see hands up, Nikki, Nikki Knox, if you'd like to lower your hand or we're here to help. Welcome everyone. My name is if Nikki's not ready, we can go to- I'm ready. Here okay. I am. Hi, good to see you, Nikki. How you doing? Um, I have a question. Um, um, it's hard to 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 get information when the person that is in federal prison they're in there because they committed a a crime in in Washington D.C. Because the offense the offense the offenses that they um, committed is not federal offenses. They're DC code offenses. So where do I go to find out? Like for instance, for good con for for good 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 time credits and FSA and different things like that. Where do I go to find out the offense codes dealing with DC? Because it doesn't fall these her offenses doesn't fall under any federal codes that yeah. may, disqualifies her or qual you know that disqualifies so Nikki, her. Let, let me let me re let me address that. And that's something that many people in our country that don't really think about until they're in the system. Our country has a, a really complicated criminal justice system. There's actually 53 different systems. There's the federal code. There's every state has a code. The military has a code. And then DC has a code. That's 53 codes. Sadly, and I'm glad you're in our community, but when you hear about things like the earned time credits and the First Step Act, that right now is a federal, that applies to people in federal prison. I don't think the Bureau of Prisons applies that to the DC code right now. And that's, that's, that is not something I can speak with authority on. I would have to do more research. But the DC code has other types of projects. And if I were in your shoes, what I would do is I would Google the DC code and, and, and the D, because any law in America is published. So like, if you want to see how that works, let's just show it. This is what advocacy in action looks like. And it doesn't matter really what the, the question is. 
you always have to be ready to self-advocate. And there are amazing tools that we have to use. We are one tool. But, you know, it's like saying there is no panacea. There is no magic pill for these problems. We always have to be working. We always have to be thinking. We always have to be creative because the system is designed to not let people out. That's just flat out. Is your, could you give me just the backstory? Well, I'm going to Google DC code. Can you tell me about the story of the, of the loved one that you're advocating for? And I'm going to share yeah. my screen and show you what I would be doing if I were you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yes, she, um, uh, it was labeled under domestic. Um, she uh, confronted her husband but they were in a DC hotel. They both live in Maryland. How much time and did she get? She got four years. How long has she been in? Um, the, oh, the whole thing is what, 10 months now. So four years, 10 months, does she have eligibility for parole in that district? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Like, um, because she's actually in one of the federal jails because with dc yes um that, once get you that. get over a certain time they send you there so 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 here is the council of the district of columbia this is what you really have to do this is what research looks like you go to this amazing website a lot of people don't know what it is it's called google okay and you just go into google and you say let me learn about the dc code pertaining to corrections okay did i do that spell that wrong i spelled it wrong and you're going to find a, a place to start. And it's like finding a thread, okay? This is what I say when I say everything on our website is free. Just like here, everything is free. But somebody's got to do the work and sit here and find it and say, okay, what's going on in D.C.? Our specialty is in the federal system because that's where I was in prison for 26 years. The DC code is a special animal, just like the code in Kansas or the code in California or the code in Florida. They're all different, but you just have to do that research to try and find it, or you need to hire somebody to do the research for you. And those, there are many people that can do that for you, but it's going to take time. If, if you don't have financial resources, I would do what I was just showing you. Google it look for 30 different leads and find it and then find what are the post-conviction uh, remedies available for DC offenders. And um, that's just a strategy that I would use. I can, I always say, I never ask anybody to do anything I didn't do. That's how I did it. That's how I still do it. So I hope that's helpful to you, Nikki. I know you would like to have a quick thing on, on how to fix it, but DC code is not our area of expertise. We know that if you're in DC, you'd serve your time in the federal system, but they have access to some programs that other people in federal prison do not have access to, and they don't have access to uh, um, other <coughs> programs that people convicted under the federal code have access to. So you're going to have to do that research. Another place for you to look and research would be right at the BOP's website and just start looking for codes on the DC code. I will try and find something and publish it on our website at Prison Professors on the DC code, but I encourage you to do the same thing, okay? Oh, I, 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 I definitely will. I have no problem with doing the work because I know she needs someone advocating for her while she does it in there. It's just that I didn't, I didn't know where to go to get started because I didn't know that they treated them so different, even they're, though it's a whole they're, di they're under a whole the different federal. law. They're an entirely different law. Right. So right. Research DC code. Okay. Research uh, yeah. post conviction in DC okay. and find out what's eligible. And then I would also look at the BOP website as well. I don't think the first step act applies to the DC code as of today. It's one of the yeah, things I we advocate for. Yeah, I really don't think so. Uh, I believe I had seen, I, I was reading a lot of stuff and I seen something where it had it, but I can't find it again, where it said DC that the First Step Act 
they didn't qualify for it, but I haven't been able to find it again. Well, let me show you where to go on the BOP's website and everybody on our community should know how to use this as well. Okay, this is not only pertaining to the DC code. This is an extraordinarily <laughs> useful website. Okay. Oh, I, I, I've been there. Okay. Many times. So you want to go here, First Step Act. Okay. And you could start reading it through here. And this would be a thread. So I would be looking through here. And I suspect that if I spent a few hours on here, I would find information about DC code because it, it, it is, it is a big part of the BOP. There are, there's more than 10,000 people, DC offenders in the federal prison system. Uh -huh. So let me just, I'm just going to do a quick scroll through here. No, I, I actually think it up at the top. I believe this may be where I found it. It said disqualifying. Um, what's the no, name? Those I are going to be disqualifying is... specific offenses, I think, but spend time here again, go to inmates, okay. go to first step act, You'll find quite a few. Then you could look at the federal register. That's the code of federal regulations. Mm -hmm. This is a higher law than the BOP policy. So the more you learn about these areas, let me see frequently asked questions, applicability of the law. I don't see DC code in here. It's just gonna take you some time, Nikki. I hope that this yeah. helps you. Oh. FSA, there's military and state offenders. That's no, but spend some time here, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of our community. Okay. We have some other uh, questions up there. I think Leonard Rollick is next. Leonard, you could unmute yourself. Yes, I'm, yes I did, and I'm, I'm very impressed with your program. I've read about you. I've looked at your uh, questionnaires with judges and talking to the wardens. And I'm, I'm just going to try to participate by learning as much as you do, because I am a paralegal in New York and I work with uh, several attorneys in the Southern District and Eastern District of New York. I've been on a lot of death penalty cases and all these gang drug cases and a lot of kids are coming. in. So I feel like I'm working at the wrong end. But, you know, if I can help some of these guys sometimes that are pretrial, that are in a system for sometimes two or three years before they get sentenced, Participating in your program will be actually an uh, excellent mitigating factor for some of these judges. And could I, uh, could I respond to that, um, Mr. Yes, Pollock? So this is also goes back to, to Donald Carper's earlier question about going into Leavenworth. Advocacy is, it is not a magic pill. I, I have to just always say that, right? It's, I've been doing this since I went into the system in 1987. And it's a long tail approach. And I'm going to tell you what we're doing right now. I'm excited about doing it with somebody like Frank uh, Glasner, who's a member of our community. I'm looking forward to doing it with other people in our community, but I'm going to tell you what it is. As I said, there are many, many moving parts to this. Part of our job is to help people in prison demonstrate that they are preparing for success upon release. If we can do that, we are more effective in speaking with members of Congress or administrators in the BOP. In order to do that, we need to disseminate more resources. And a lot of times indigent people that are in prison don't have access to these resources. The Bureau of Prisons is providing it in specific regions, but they're not providing everything because it's the they're, that's not their business is to help people in prison get ready. It's changing, but it's still a big challenge. So one of the things that we're doing, Leonard, is we're working with businesses and asking businesses to sponsor indigent people to go through the project and they'll get scholarships. So if somebody's then now we have an intern is Aaliyah on this um, webinar. If you are, would you unmute yourself, Aaliyah? I don't know if you're there or not. I, I am here. Okay. So Aaliyah, tell Aaliyah, tell us where uh, you go to school. I go to school at American University in Washington, D.C. And and tell them how you and I met. 
Okay, um, so I was taking a class called Prison Communities, and one of my professors, um, he believed that it was really important that when we're learning about the prison community that we get in touch with a lot of people who have actually been inside the system and who are now out of the system and advocating for people that are still inside the system. So um, Michael came to our class as a guest speaker, he introduced himself to us, and we met that way, and then he mentioned at the end of the class that he was looking for interns, and so I raised my hand. So this is this is advocacy in action. So now I find somebody at one of the best universities in America who is also passionate about social justice and tell them about the project, the scholarship project that we're working on right now, Aaliyah. So right now um, we're gonna be having about 100 people being sponsored at least for the first round. Um, so we're gonna be passing out 100 different workbooks to people to um, help them plan their release after prison, as well as I think it's the five hour course that we're offering people? That's what we'll start with. Yes. Okay. So we're starting out with um, a five hour course. We're sending out a hundred of those books free to people who are in prison that submitted an application. They were responding to a question asking them what success looks like to them in prison. And based off their responses, we're going to be going through reading those, choosing which ones we think are the ones who are like the most dedicated and the most passionate. Then those are the people we're going to be sending out workbooks to. Um, of course, like Ideally, we would like to be able to send them out to everybody for free, um, but there's just only so much that we can do. So we're going to be starting with 100 now, um, but Michael and I are going to try and work with um, other administrators at different prisons to see how much more accessible we can make our books. Well, we'll also work with businesses, and we're going out to businesses, and Frank Glasner had the, had the um, I will say, the, the just the, what's the right word, Frank? Just the, the, the the confidence to say, hey, I wanna be a part of it. I wanna start my own scholarship. And so Frank used his connections to go out to a business and a business that he had a connection with, we didn't even have a connection with said, yes, we're gonna sponsor a hundred people. So there's going to be on this new website we're building called Prison Professors Talent. It'll be Prison Professors Talent slash scholarship, uh, Glasner scholarship or whatever he calls it. And then the 100 people that are going through our course, they'll be publishing their responses to, these, to this growth program, and we'll publish it on the website. Now, what's the benefit of this? Frank is going to be able to demonstrate how he is working to reconcile with society. The people in prison are going to get free resources. Businesses that support it are saying, hey, we're doing our part to reduce recidivism. All of this becomes a creative, innovative way to pursue advocacy. I couldn't do it without Aaliyah. Aaliyah will be the one that goes in there and collects the answers that these students in prison are making. They're gonna be coming from all over the country. So we're not cherry picking people. We're not choosing people. It is part of a path that I want you to be thinking about. Think about something now when Frank goes before his probation officer at some point, or when Frank is advocating to get out of prison early, he's going to be able to say, when they say to him, why, let me just ask somebody here that I don't know. Let's take a look at, um, I'm just gonna pick a name here. Let's just see, I'm gonna pick, uh, let me just see, Michael White, can you unmute yourself? Unmute yourself, Michael. Are you, are you, can you talk? I don't know if I, I can't hear you. Shoot. I got to find somebody that can unmute themselves. Hey, Michael. Sorry there we that. go. Michael White. Have <laughs> we spoken before? Uh, no, sir. Okay, so Michael, I'm gonna ask you a question. Are you like a justice impacted person? Are you going to prison? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty positive I am. So I'm uh, just now, I spoke with, I did a proffer last month and then I, I'm pre-indictment, but I, I got a plea offer this week. So I don't, I don't wanna ask about that. I'm gonna ask you a different question. Do you, do you have any idea, like, what do you think you're looking at? Yes, sir. What, what do you think that is? I believe just from the videos and looking at the sentencing guideline, because I, I, my plea deal is for one count of wire fraud. Like what kind of what kind of time 000? do you think that is? Twenty to thirty months. Okay, let's just hypothetically say you get twenty-four months. Okay, 
And I showed you that calculator and that calculator says, well, there is some discretion there. And on 24 months, maybe you can get out in like 12. Okay. But you got to do everything. I'm, I've got discretion over you now, Michael. How, why should I let you out? You got 24 months. Make that case for me. Why you should let me out? Yeah. Um, to be honest, Michael, and this is where I'm at in my journey. I'm not sure that I believe that I'm, that I feel that I should be let out. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, you're a unique guy <laughs> because everybody, everybody. I mean, like I got four young kids and I, I think that I, and I genuinely did not. This, the reason I got in trouble I was not something that I intentionally did. Not that most people probably did not intend to get in trouble. But for me, I had a, I had a commodity company and a company froze my assets. Not, not, nothing legal. But then they, uh, no, at least nothing on the criminal stuff. But they, a company from New York, I'm in Texas. I'm in Beaumont, Texas. But they <laughs> use that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm not saying anything. I, what I, let me be, well, I want it for the purposes of this statement, what I'm trying to get to. And, and we could talk offline or you could talk with a member of our team. The purposes that I would like our, everybody in our community to understand is when I used Frank as an example, when it comes time for Frank to go and ask for why he should get some consideration for a higher level of liberty at an earlier time, he's going to be able to show something that is different in his life that did not exist at the time he was sentenced. He's going to have a whole new body of work. And when okay, somebody well, does I will that, say that oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. When somebody does that, they're stronger. And I want yes, everybody in our community to come up with their plan. Why are you worthy of, of getting the, the discretion that you want to use in your favor? You've got to be thinking about that early. Yes, sir. And I've, I've watched, I mean, I'm very thankful for all your videos. I mean, I've been, but I've been, so I've been on top of this before, way before I ever even knew that I was honestly under investigation because the state had investigated me, but then they dropped it. Are you but, working um, with a member of our team, our community? No, sir. I, I don't, I have four young kids. And so I just don't have the funds because I, well, you, so I the, these are free. These webinars yes, are sir. free. So you can come here and learn anytime you want and you can get everything free on our website and you can get books and you can get courses. You can get anything you want, but I yes, really sir. highly recommend every day. You think about what seeds can I sow today so that I can make better arguments in the future for a higher level of liberty. And when you're asking that question, I definitely want you to be thinking about the people who have that discretion. They don't have a fiduciary duty to you. They don't see that they have an obligation to you. They, they look at something different. And you've got to be thinking about this as you work, as you plan for the future. But yes, I'm gonna... I will say, like, I, have, I have started working, like just doing, um, working for DoorDash. Like good. they set up like a good, and, um, and I, I, so like whenever, before I ever even talk with the feds, I just did a proper last month and I, um, but I haven't been working for eight months or during the business. I closed my business down eight months ago so that I didn't have any record of me. I didn't want them to think that I was trying to continue making bad decisions. So I'm not. Well, that's good. That's good. Stick with the webinar. I'm going to, I got to turn to some of the other yes, questions. Sir. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, Thank you. sorry that I didn't know the answer. Not, no, you did great. I, 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 I want you to have a successful journey, and I hope that you find value in our community. I do. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you. Um, Dr. Rothstein, I see your hand is up. Do you, uh, how about you, Frank Glasner? Yes. Hey, how are you, Michael? Hi. Um, so th- th- thanks so much for the plug there. Um, you know, and we all put our heads together, you know, when we talked about advocacy um, uh, of what to do and, you know, how to make, you know, best case and honestly to forge some new ground here, uh, specifically with the, uh, you know, you know, success after release from prison, uh, new materials and the courses that you created, uh, as well as the, the teaching guides. Uh, this all rose out of a, you know, you putting this together, uh, we've all been working together, uh, you know, myself, yourself, um, you know, uh, Carol Santos, uh, Justin from time to time, uh, and others on, you know, my journey uh, that I'm just about to go take uh, in, within Butner, you know, on uh, June 26th, 
or about your camp. Uh, having said that, one of the things that I was very, very excited about was the success after prison uh, course. And then we had discussed uh, how to build this into my uh, stay there, my journey. Uh, and then subsequently be able to potentially teach the course uh, at a minimum uh, to try and help other justice impacted people take the course as well, because it's phenomenal. Uh, and then coming up with the solutions and discussion with you on how to put together uh, a scholarship, uh, which I would never, by the way, call the Glasner Scholarship Fund. I prefer to remain anonymous. We'll, we'll, we'll choose something great. Uh, but, you know, We've already started to build this into my release plan, uh, you know, which is, is really taken on a life of its own. I can't stress enough how much that release plan is important. Uh, and, and then just working together uh, and uh, self-advocating before I even surrender myself you know, in a month or so. Um, so I couldn't be more proud of this. I, you know, it's oxymoronic. I'm actually excited about, you know, starting my journey and being able to do this and very, very excited about being able to make a, a contribution well, we're, here. We're, this is a team effort, right? They're, like there's, we've got a lot of members of our community and our team, and I'm grateful to every member of our team. I'm grateful to every member of our community because all of this is part of the ecosystem where we need people like Joseph DiGregorio, who's on there, Joseph, why don't you unmute yourself and tell them about your experience and what, what, what you're doing with us now. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's good to see everyone again. And um, so I was just um, released from uh, March 21st from federal prison. I'm on an ankle monitor right now. And, and tell so them your backstory because there's so many, like I don't know a lot of the people on this community and, and I'm sure none of them, many of them don't know you. What were you looking at what did you get and how did you get home? Okay, so uh, it started with a phone call from the government that same day. I, I called Justin, started working with you guys. And um, shortly after uh, the same year, I got a plea um, of 41 to 51 months. And um, the day, you know, I started working with Justin and, uh, you know, he told me that you know, this is uh, no magic bullet. You have to put all the work in. And I took it as seriously as I could. I, I worked nonstop. Um, then I got sentencing, um, wound up getting sentenced to a year and a day. And um, I got sent to a federal medical center in Devons, Massachusetts. So um, I had the release plan. Um, of course, I had the narrative. Narrative was in my PSR. I did the website with you um, and Justin and uh, everyone. And I also did the community service work with you. And I did other things on the side. I volunteered for a soup kitchen. Uh, I spoke at detox clinics. Uh, I joined AA. I got letters from there. I worked at Amazon. I worked at a golf course. I did everything and anything I could to make sure that I left it all on the table. Um, and then I could, you know, when I surrendered, uh, I was going to say, you know what? I left it all out there. And uh, so then when I surrendered, it was funny because the last gentleman that was just speaking was saying, you know, how, you know, happy he had looked forward to actually surrendering. Um, I went up there the night before with my wife, we stayed at a hotel. And as I was getting dropped off to the prison, I was very happy. I was, I was smiling in the car and I got out of the car. I walked into prison with a big smile on my face. And, you know, I, after R&D, strip search, they've taken me to solitary for quarantine for a week. And I'm walking through the compound with a big smile on my face. And, you know, and then uh, I was just happy to get it over it because it was a very exhausting journey leading up to it. Like prison was, was, you know, it wasn't really, first of all, it wasn't really what I thought it was going to be, even though it was an FMC, it was a higher security or whatever. But uh, it was, um, <clears throat> You know, I had challenges, you know, have an organ transplant. I had an organ rejection while I was in prison that I was sent to the hospital um, for a month, uh, which was extremely scary, you know, being changed to the hospital bed and having two federal agents by your side 24 seven and being handcuffed with your arm and having your ankles iron shackled to the hospital bed while you're having an organ rejection in prison. I couldn't speak to my family. My wife didn't know where I was. No one could get in touch with me. 
it was extremely challenging. Uh, and it was, it was very, you know, that part was very, was, was serious. But then, you know, upon surrendering, I brought the release plan with me. And I also had a copy mailed in to me. And I worked on that uh, pretty extensively. And when I handed it to my case manager, after the first two weeks being in there, my first team meeting, um, she said she never saw anything like that. And she, I said, can you please put this in my file? Look it over. This is my release plan. I, I did a lot of work on this. I would really, so she started looking at it. And then I saw her a few days later in my unit and she said, uh, you know, I, I've never seen anything like that. The, the closest I've seen to anyone having a release plan is a few sentences jotted down saying, I'll be at this house. I have a landline and, and, and here's, and here's the address and phone number. She says, you know, I, I showed it to your unit manager and they were very, very impressed. That same day I met her, I handed her two book reports because every book I was reading, I was I was handing her book report after book report, and she was, um, she she was she she loved that as well. And then when the time came to, you know, ask for home confinement, she advocated on my behalf. Uh, you know, she wasn't giving a lot of. Everyone was asking to go home, right? Everyone wants to go home in there, and. You know, every day when they have an open house from 2 to 3 p.m., you know, everyone's lined up there. I didn't do that. Like, I, I just, I laid low. I was like the submarine. And, uh, you know, even the counselor said, you know, he said, I never even see you. You know, I never even, you know, and I was just doing a lot of reading in my in my cell. I had to lose a lot of weight. That was my, that was my thing. I lost 62 pounds while I was in there. And uh, I'm continuing to lose a lot more weight. I was walking around the unit. Um, constantly because Massachusetts in winter, it was just snowing nonstop up there. And uh, so I was inside the unit walking around and 13 laps around the unit was a mile. So I was just constantly doing that. And um, listen, it, it, it's, it's weird to say a pleasant experience in federal prison. It's like, it, it may seem counterintuitive, but you know, because incarceration is uh it's associated with all these negative uh, experiences and negative things, but I found it to be, even though I went through health challenges in there, it was, you know, the, you know, the end of the road, this big journey going through all these different stages, which I know everyone on this, on this call that's going through this, you know, exactly where you are in all your stages, whatever you're going through. And um, I have to just say that, you know, I have to, I'm so glad to be home. You know, you have this emphasis. I emphasized on personal growth while I was in there, you know, and I wanted to use the time to um, not just reflect on my actions and make positive changes, but, you know, it's, uh, I formed some good relationships in there. Um, of course, there's a lot of people you don't want to associate in there, but I was, um, um, I taught a sales class in there. It was, it was three classes. And, uh, you know, people were asking me, you know, what, what can I do? I was like, you know, there's a lot of things you could do. You could do credit card processing. You could do, you know, um, Amazon FBA is big. You know, there's a lot of different things you could do, you know, with the felony that you could come out and reinvent yourself and come out reincarnated. And a lot of people in there don't know what they're doing. And a lot of people don't know how to advocate with the administrative remedy. It's so funny. I don't want to just tell you this quick story. I don't want to take too much of your time. When I got out of quarantine and I'm walking to my unit in, in, uh, in into general population, I go into my unit and I met someone who my lawyer had uh, was waiting for me because he was a client of my lawyer. So they take me to the TV room and he was showing me around showers and everything. So I'm holding all my stuff and I didn't even go into my cell yet. And I see on the table in the TV room, a prison professor, rem administrative remedy book. And it's 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 on the pile in the middle. And I I walk over to the table. I'm like, whose book is this? So, you know, I started talk, talking to this gentleman about it. And and, uh, you know, they would they were doing administrative remedies on your own. And I said, everything is in this book right here. It was just so funny how I seen that book in there as soon as I uh, as soon as I re was released from quarantine. And um Joseph, I, I want to thank you. I'm really glad that you're home. And I just wanted to let members of our community know that Joseph is the kind of person that is a resource for us. 
And when people are anxious and worrying about what's it going to be like when we go in there, the reality is we need to have a lot of members of our team. We need Scott to be able to talk to the people who are looking for personal guidance. We need Justin to create the marketing videos because people don't even know what they don't know. They don't know that they can start sowing seeds today for the success they wanna to get tomorrow. My work is on the institutional side and advocacy efforts. Um, Joseph is available along with other people to um, respond to questions about what things are going, you know, how, what things are, are available um, uh, while you're in prison or what, how did they have a personal experience? You know, so it, there, it's like Hillary, the, to use it to quote Hillary Clinton's book, you know, it takes a village to build what we're doing. It takes a lot of people in the community. It takes you, every one of you. Joseph got the best outcome because he prepared. And I saw um, some of you may are asking questions. How do I get these books? Well, I'm going to show you because it's not a secret, right? We, we have so many resources that we try to give to people. Um, but of course, we're just, I'm just a guy who came out of prison. I'm not Walmart, you know, I'm just a guy who comes out of prison. So if you want to, you know, if you, if we don't publish it for on our website, I mean, we do publish just about everything on our website. But if you go to our website, it's right there. It's super simple. There's more than a thousand pages here. And if you scroll through it all, you'll learn so much. But if you want specific books, just go here. Go to resources, our books and courses, and you will see these are the five-hour courses right here. This is the 10-hour course that's being used in prisons. This is a, a book that really all of our work is predicated on. These are different personal development exercises, workbooks that are available. There's a, um, there's so many of them. I don't think that we have our newest one on there. Um, we have a release plan right there. How do you build one? Well, it's, there's, a, there's a book on it. You, if you get the book, you can learn all of these things, or you can get somebody on our team to do it for you, or you could just learn as much as you possibly can. What you can't do is is bury your head in the sand and 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 not not move forward on your own. So I, I just wanted to share that resource for people. I also wanted to respond to um, uh, people that I saw in the chat. Um, I saw I'm here on behalf of my son. This is from I don't I didn't get the name. I'm here on behalf of my son. He was taken into custody before a sentencing nine months prior. He was at MDC. It was a terrible experience for the poor guy. His sentence was on November 7th. He signed up for RDAP and has been taking classes. Does our calculator work? Yes, our calculator works for any situation. It'll be on our website, I suspect, by the end of the day today. Um, it'll be super easy to find. I'll probably also send out a blast email to everybody in our community so that you can um, see the, uh, the calculator. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And Robert Reyes, you, I want you to know you're a big part of our program also. You've created a course with us on social media that we're taking into prisons. And this should become a part of your advocacy campaign. And we'll talk about that offline. So I just wanted to say that. I see that there's another person that, that raised their hand, but it doesn't say a name. It just says iPad. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Good afternoon, Michael. Uh, my name is uh, Robert. I'm not justice impacted. I'm retired military, is retired for wounds I received, but I am volunteering at the uh, federal prison near me, medium security, and doing a veterans resilience support group. And then the next program is Soldier On. Which prison um, is that? Berlin, FCI. Oh, really? I just connected with this SOE at Berlin and the reentry coordinator there. I mentioned your name to her and said, here. And I got onto your site because I wanted to understand what these men's. Now, my, my interactions only with men who were incarcerated veterans there. And to understand the situations and the predicaments and the mindset they experience is through their journey through the federal prison system. And I found it incredibly enlightening reading your blog, your book entries, um, because then I can be more understanding and adaptive to their needs. And as I get the lesson plan, you know, 
uh, because they're getting first step back credits for completing these courses. We give them a certificate and then they get credits. And I just want to say this is invaluable to me every week, um, listening to you so I can use well, that if knowledge. You, and if you give it, first of all, thanks for your service. I mean, we always appreciate the military and the people that devote their lives to keeping us safe. So thanks for that. And then, and then just going on and helping people in prison is just an incredibly noble thing. Many people want to forget about people in prison and we appreciate you. Um, if you send me an email with an address, I, I'll send you a full suite of books that you could use. Um, but I want you to know we just sent a big box to Berlin. So they I, should have them hopefully by tomorrow or Monday or Tuesday. And um, hopefully they'll be bringing them in. That's one of the areas that, are, that we'll try and get a scholarship for as well. So um, people don't have to pay for them. But we're really grateful to you. This is all part of our effort to try and change the law. And I'm really excited about connecting with people like you. Thanks so much. Yeah, for being part of our thank you. And I am also advocating to get more volunteers in the area I live in arts to work in different programs for the guys because they need everything they can get as they go through the journey. And you got a good team of people that work inside the institution there, reentry coordinators such who really want to uh, help people. So thank you for doing that for her. And Appreciate them. it. Thank you. Are there okay. questions in there that I didn't answer yet? If you do, you don't have to raise your hand. Just unmute yourself. It's 1130 in California. And I want to make sure that we haven't ignored anybody that has a question. Uh, Michael, I have a question. If uh, for people that were in a holding facility, um, do they they do not give the um, the, the FSA credits, the, the 10 days per month, correct? Right. Well, so, it didn't affect me, but I have a friend of mine that was in for 30 months in Newark. So so you're right. And, and I want you to understand why it's not it's something they can do by law. The law the law reads that in order to get the first step back credits, first, you have to have a pattern score and be scored as a lower or a minimum risk. Then you have to have a, a needs assessment done. Uh, and a risk assessment done. And that qualifies the person to get the first 10 days. If a person's in a county jail, they can't get those things done because they're not federal officers there. So until mm -hmm. that's done, that's part of the problem. So, okay. so, and, um, and what, and what about the uh, good time? Do they get the, the, do they get that 54 days for the year or? I don't think they get that until they get to federal prison. Well, I thought too. Have they been sentenced yet? Oh yeah, she she got nine years, but she she was waiting in Newark for thirty three months. Okay, so so she's she's got a lot of history. I would recommend that you get her that post conviction book. Um, she yeah, I had got I think I had gotten that one to her. I just published I, it, so you haven't gotten. Oh this okay, one. I left I left her with with. Uh, two of the books that we had at the time, uh, the, so the new book one, and the new one, the post conviction book, it really explains um, advocacy strategies that she can pursue that if I were in her shoes, that's what I would be doing. I would be building a case um, that, that might help me reinstate all the credits that I lost because she lost yes. them through no fault of her own. Right. She, she did, she did file with the courts um, under, you know, under unconscionability. Um, the thing about it is it's, it, it's always a discretionary matter, which mm -hmm. is why people can always learn from people, from stories like Joe's who became really good at self-advocacy and got out of, got a much lower sentence, first of all, and then successfully advocated to get out of prison, even though we had a lower sentence. So I wish her the best. And okay. um, thank I, you. I will look for that book. Okay, thank you. It, it's I don't I just I just looked at our website. It's not on our website, but I we will get it up by the weekend. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank Are you. There, um, I I I'd like to speak with Robert. Are you on there, Robert? Robert Reyes. Could you unmute yourself, Robert, if you're there? I'm here, Michael. Sorry about that. <clears throat> That's okay. Um, I know you asked me a question, but it's just a lot easier than me to go search for it in that chat. That just, just what's your question again? Correct. So just kind of best practices from the standpoint of kind of, you know, dealing with um, guards. I've been hearing a lot of different input regarding guards. I've heard some are very easy to work with and others are kind of difficult and more disgruntled. So what's the best way um, 
to kind of interact with them to stay out of the radar and kind of, you know, just not be involved with them. I, th I think the best way is to always be polite, always be respectful, always um, work toward um, understanding that they are there to do a job and mm -hmm. that job is not to let you out of prison early. So the more you understand that, the more you're going to develop your critical thinking skills. You can't okay. go through this system thinking they are there to let you out of prison because they're not. And if you do, you're, they're going to look at you through, a, through the kind of lens that you don't want them to look at you through. Mm -hmm. I would always encourage people that's going into this system to begin by thinking, okay, I cannot change that a federal judge imposed this, whatever that sentence is. That is a, there's only two people that can do that. A judge or the president of the United States. That's it. And people in prison, they are going to respect that judgment. So don't, if I, let me just say hypothetically that I've got a six year sentence. Hypothetically. I don't want to go in there the first month and be saying, okay, what can I do to get out of prison? Because it's the wrong battle to fight. You've got to be a CEO right now. You've got to be the general of your life. And being the general of your life, it says, there are going to be some battles I've got to be willing to lose in order to win the war. This is a war. Right. Your war yeah. is I want to get out at the soonest possible time. If I understand that, then... I'm not even going to be thinking about advocating to get out of prison until I've done at least a reasonable amount of time. I've got to become extraordinary and compelling, not in my eyes, but in the eyes of people that have discretion over you. The more you think about that, the better off you're going to be. And if I had six years, hypothetically, I wouldn't be thinking about this until... I had 25% or 30% of my sentence in. Like, that's a good strategy. Okay, my first 30, my first 20, 20 to 30%, I'm going to be building a record. Like I told you about Frank, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have 50 people that, I'm, like, I'm going to build a tribe of people who are going to say, I changed their life. I'll give you an example. I, while I'm sitting here talking on the phone, talking with you guys, I just saw, I'll just share it with you. My wife hates it when I do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, because it's so it's 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 everything I say is authentic. I'm not telling you to do anything I didn't do. This came at 1055 a.m. California time. So I was on this webinar. Hello, Michael. My name is Scott. This has been an email in the making for a while. First off, I greatly appreciate everything you've done to help me, not just yourself, but others. You've created an amazing life for yourself. Congratulations. This guy's telling me he goes on saying we changed his life. I don't know him. He's in CDCR. He was serving 12 years. I've never met this person. But what I do with people like this is I'll take their stories and I'll use it to go to leaders and say, these are people that are changing their life. We need to incentivize a pursuit of excellence. And by me showing how many people are doing it, I obliterate these excuses that people say, not everybody can do what you did. Okay. I know that every person on this webinar is exceptional and compelling, but you don't got to convince me. You got to convince people that are, have a very cynical view. And so Robert, when you're going in there, mm -hmm. despite your inclination, your very natural and human inclination to be saying, I just want to get back to my wife and kids. That's a very natural inclination, mm -hmm. but it's not a very strategic one. You've got to be deliberate. You've got to visualize success, create a plan, put priorities in place. And you and I have worked on this. You've worked on building your own lesson plan. I know that Jack's on this webinar. I need to build a lesson plan with Jack. Okay. You've got to be, you got to build that. Then I'll take it, get it into distribution to hundreds of thousands of people. And you are going to be able to, advocate for yourself more effectively because you can show I'm mm -hmm. different from the person who got sentenced. That's, that's what I learned how to do. And, hey, and I always say, I would never ask anybody to do anything I didn't do, but you've got to always have your eyes 
wide open in there and understand the system is not designed to say, let me figure out a way to get Michael out of prison. That's not the system. It, that, to, to pursue that path is like going to a basketball game and trying to see a touchdown. Okay. That, that's a, that doesn't happen. Let's think strategically. How can we succeed in the world as it exists? And the more right. we think about that, the stronger we're going to become. So, okay. All right. But you're super Thanks, smart, Robert. You've built a career in sales. You've had to learn how to read people. And you're going to do that in, in that environment as well. So just okay. remember, prison is a microcosm of the world. And you can, mm -hmm. you will become successful. And, and you're going to get a tremendous amount of resources from us. Because I produce content every day. Yeah, you guys are awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Are there any other questions at 1130? Then we're going to be back next Thursday. Actually, I won't be here because I'll be traveling to Thompson, Illinois to do this work inside of a prison while my team will carry on with these webinars. We believe in you and we want to thank you for being a part of our community. I am Michael Santos and I just thank you for being with us. Bye-bye.